Welcome to this video on shear center, shear flow, and shear stress from bending. This is one of several videos in a short course on cross-section analysis posted at Tiryaz Toolbox, a website that contains notes, examples, and algorithms for structural analysis. Please visit the website for more videos and other material relevant for this course. There are a number of quantities that may be of interest in a cross-section analysis. Many of them are shown on this slide, but the scope in this video is more limited. Specifically, the objective is to calculate shear flow and shear stress in the cross-sections of Euler Bernoulli beams subjected to bending. Once those quantities are determined, it is an additional objective to determine the coordinates of the so-called shear center in the cross-section. The video on omega diagrams in warping torsion contains an alternative approach for determining the shear center. When approaching shear stresses in bending, an anomaly in Euler Bernoulli beam theory is observed. An overview of the quantities of that boundary value problem is shown on this slide. Notice that axial stress and strain appear, but neither shear stress nor shear strain. The Euler Bernoulli beam theory adopts the assumption that plane sections remain plane and perpendicular to the neutral axis. In other words, the only strain that takes place is the axial shortening and elongation of the fibers in the cross section. This excludes shear strain. With no shear strain, there is no shear stress. In turn, there is no shear force. In other words, Shear stress and shear force are not initially part of the boundary value problem that we call Euler Bernoulli beam theory. This is an anomaly, because shear force will appear even in simple beams that are subjected to transversal load. This is shown on the next slide, which makes the point that shear is caused by change in bending moment value along the beam. There is no shear force if the value of the bending moment is constant along the beam. The cantilevered beam at the top of this slide is one example. It is subjected to a point moment on the right-hand side. As a result, the bending moment diagram is a straight line, meaning that the bending moment is constant along the beam. Only a bending moment is needed as a support reaction on the left-hand side. There is no shear force in this beam because the bending moment is constant. We will verify this fact shortly. The beam case below has a point force applied at the right-hand side, resulting in the linearly varying bending moment diagram shown here. Now we see on the left-hand side that a vertical shear force is needed for the beam to be in equilibrium. This is an important insight. Equilibrium will soon tell us that it is the change in the bending moment along the beam that is associated with this shear force. Soon, we will also see that it is the change in axial stress that leads us to determine the shear stress. In preparation for the latter task, the next slide shows how we calculate the axial stress. The figure provides an overview of the ingredients of the boundary value problem for Euler Bernoulli beams. As usual in the notes posted at Tiryaz Toolbox, equilibrium and section integration equations are on the left hand side, kinematic compatibility is on the right hand side and the material law at the bottom links the two sides. The equation in the red circle combines section integration, material law, and kinematic compatibility. The equation in the blue circle combines only material law and kinematic compatibility. By solving for the second-order derivative of the displacement in the red equation and substituting the result into the blue equation, the expression in the green circle is obtained. That last result is how we calculate axial stress, once we have the bending moment. We see that the axial stress is the moment, multiplied by the distance from the centroid to the fiber where we want the axial stress, divided by the moment of inertia. The recovery of shear force from varying bending moment, and the recovery of shear stress from varying axial stress, is addressed on the next slide. Let us first use this figure to determine the shear force. By taking moment equilibrium about the right-hand side edge of this infinitesimally small beam element, we find that the shear force is equal to the derivative of the bending moment. This is exactly what was done in the video on Euler Bernoulli beam theory, posted at Tiryaz Toolbox. It is the equations on the right-hand side that are new here. The first equation represents equilibrium of stresses. In order to establish that equation, we first make an imaginary cut along the longitudinal direction of the beam. 
On the faces of that cut we introduce an unknown horizontal force, denoted QS and marked with a red color. Because the axial stress changes from one side of this small beam element to the other, this red colored force is needed in order for the cut portion of the beam to be in equilibrium. The force, QS, is called shear flow, as will become clearer on the next slide. The first equation on the right-hand side establishes equilibrium in the horizontal direction. The force from the shear flow arrow marked with red is QS times the length dx because shear flow is force per unit length. This is also why the symbol lowercase q is used. That symbol is used several places in Tiriaz toolbox for distributed force per unit length. The force QS times dx is equal to the integral of the surplus stress, d sigma over the portion of the area of the cross-section that is outside the cut. That area is denoted by the symbol A with the subscript S remember. This is the area of the cross-section that is outside the cut where we calculate the shear flow. Next we introduce the equation from Euler-Bernoulli beam theory derived on the previous slide, which says that axial stress is bending moment times the distance from the centroid to the fiber where the stress is calculated, divided by the moment of inertia. Shorthand notation is introduced in the equation below. In order to obtain that equation, we divide through by dx and recognize that dm over dx is the shear force, v, which is a fact we derived on the left-hand side of this slide. The result is that the shear flow is v, q, over i, where q is a new quantity defined in the blue box as the integral of z over the area as shown in blue in the figure namely the area of the cross-section that is outside the cut where we calculate the shear flow. In practical applications, that integral is often evaluated by separating the cross-section into n number of basic parts and summing over them. What we sum from each cross-section part is the area of the part times the distance from the centroid of the cross-section to the centroid of the part. Before we move on to the next slide, please note that we made the assumption on this slide that the beam is prismatic namely straight along the x-axis with a uniform cross-section along that axis. Unless the beam is prismatic, the equilibrium equation developed on this slide is an approximation. The next slide illustrates shear flow by means of red arrows. An important point in this slide is that the shear flow actually flows around in the cross-section. Because of the pairwise appearance of shear stress, shown in the upper right corner and dictated by equilibrium, the red shear flow arrows that appeared on an imaginary cut on the previous slide meet their equal counterparts at a 90 degree angle. That means the shear flow arrows can be drawn as a flow along the walls of the cross section for this thin walled wide flange cross section. Notice how the red arrows in this figure flow in a consistent direction. The shear flow at the outer edges of each flange is zero because then it is meeting a free surface. Moreover, the shear flow is continuous. That means the two rivers of shear coming towards the web from each side of the flange add up to a shear flow that is twice as large at the top of the web. The river analogy for continuity and shear flow in a cross section is good, because those two rivers combine to become a river that naturally is twice as large as each flange river in the shear flow at the top of the web. Mathematically, the fact stems from the fact that the area AS becomes twice as large as soon as we make a cut in the web instead of the flange. The cross-section analysis examples posted at Tiriaz toolbox visualize the shear flow by means of a diagram for each part of the cross-section. Once the shear flow is determined, we can contemplate the concept of a shear center, which is done on the next slide. The concept has an interesting history, dating back to the construction of mono-wing airplanes. The wings of such modern aircraft are essentially cantilevered beams subjected to torsion. The shear center of a cross section is the same as the center of twist, and any load applied with an eccentricity to the shear center will contribute to torque on the cross section. That is shown here for a channel profile. Notice that the shear center is far left of the actual cross section and its centroid. If you apply vertical force along the web of this cross section, then it will rotate. If you apply vertical force at the centroid of this cross section, then it will rotate. It is only if you apply the vertical force exactly at the shear center, which again is outside the cross section itself, that this beam will not rotate. In summary, the shear center of a cross section, sometimes called the center of twist, 
is the point in the cross-section through which the load must act in order to avoid rotation of the cross-section. The coordinates of the shear center are denoted YSC and ZSC, and there are several techniques to determine them. The simplest case is double symmetric cross-sections. For such cross-sections the shear center coincides with the centroid. Also, if the cross-section has one axis of symmetry then the shear center is located somewhere on that symmetry axis. In Tier Yaz Toolbox, the document on warping torsion describes one approach for the determination of the shear center for thin-walled cross-sections, utilizing omega diagrams. Furthermore, the document on St. Venant torsion presents an approach for generic solid cross-sections. A simpler approach based on equilibrium is presented in this video for thin-walled cross-sections. It employs the fact that the shear flow must be in equilibrium about the shear center. If both YSC and ZSC are unknown, then two equilibrium equations are established. One in the Y direction for a shear force applied in that direction and one equilibrium equation in the Z direction for a shear force applied in that direction. The following procedure is suggested for the cross-section shown in this slide, which requires only one equilibrium equation because the cross-section is symmetric about the horizontal axis. First, select an arbitrary point along the symmetry axis as trial shear center, and let a variable, say E, denote the distance from the centroid to that point. Second, determine the shear flow in the cross-section due to a shear force in the direction perpendicular to the axis of symmetry. Third, Write the equation that expresses the moment of the shear flow about the trial shear center. The variable E will appear in this expression. Finally, set the expression equal to zero and solve for E. The next slide calculates the shear stress from the shear flow. The shear flow, QS, is force per unit length along the member. When we divide by the thickness of the cross section at a particular location, denoted by T in this slide, then we get the shear stress. In this slide, shear flow is marked with red and the shear stress is marked with blue. Using the formula for shear flow derived earlier in this video, we find that the shear stress at a location in the cross section is VQ over IT. The first point made on the next slide is that the shear stress may not be uniform over the thickness. Consider the solid cross sections on the right hand side. The shear stress will be uniform along a horizontal line drawn through this cross section. That is because the sides of the cross section are vertical. The shear stress is also uniform along a horizontal line drawn in the middle of the circular cross section, but not elsewhere. For the triangle cross section, the shear stress will not be uniform along any horizontal line drawn through the cross section. That being said, it is often possible to apply the uniform shear stress assumption as an approximation. That may work well, even for circular and triangular cross sections. This is demonstrated in the 1969 textbook by Timoshenko and Goodyear. If we move away from the solid cross sections on the right hand side and consider so called thin walled cross sections, then the assumption of uniform shear stress along a cut is generally valid. That is because we always make the cut perpendicular to the contour of the cross section. In fact, for thin walled cross sections, we often introduce an S axis that runs along the contour of the cross section at any given point. However, for thin walled cross sections, it is necessary to distinguish between open and closed cross sections. Open cross sections are shown on the left hand side of this slide. In contrast, the closed cross sections in the middle are characterized by having one cell enclosed by the walls of the cross section. Some closed cross sections have multiple cells. In terms of shear flow, closed cross sections are more challenging. The next slide shows a closed cross section with the S axis defined. The problem here is that shear flow cannot be solved by equilibrium alone. If you make a cut at a particular location in this cross section, how do you define the area AS that is outside the cut? Also, for a general set of cross section dimensions, illustrated here by a thicker wall on the right hand side, we cannot point to any specific location that has zero shear flow. In short, this problem is conceptually identical to facing statically indeterminate structures in structural analysis. The determination of shear flow in closed cross sections using equilibrium can be carried out in two ways. In the approach addressed first, 
the shear flow is determined before the shear center. This approach explicitly recognizes that the calculation of shear flow in a closed cross-section is a statically indeterminate problem. In other words, equilibrium equations alone are insufficient to determine the SOT forces. Each cell is associated with one redundant. Similar to the flexibility method in structural analysis, the solution approach involves the removal of the capacity of the structure to carry the unknown forces we seek. In that approach, we introduce cuts in the structure to make it determinate, and then to enforce compatibility equations that are solved for the unknown forces. In the following, the shown thin-walled cross-section with one cell is considered. One cut is introduced to make it an open cross-section. At the cut there will develop a discrepancy in U displacement at each side of the cut. The compatibility equation requires this displacement to be zero, shown in the top equation on this slide. Notice that du are the infinitesimal contributions that are integrated along the s-axis, which runs through the middle thickness along the cross-section. The bottom figure on this slide shows an infinitesimal part of the cross-section of a beam element, seen from the side of the beam. The figure illustrates the kinematic relationship between the shear strain, gamma, and the quantity du, namely that gamma is du, ds. In the theory of torsion, there would be another contribution to the shear strain. That is observed in the video on warping torsion in the short course on structural members. However, here it is understood that the rotation of the cross-section is zero if the shear force acts through the shear center. In short, the change in axial displacement at two points located a distance ds apart is gamma times ds as shown here. Next, Material law provides the following expression for the shear strain in terms of the shear stress and thus the shear flow, where G is the shear modulus and T is the thickness of the cross-section wall, which may vary around the circumference. By combining the previous equations we get this result, and integration around the cell yields the total gap opening at the cut. This is set to zero to enforce kinematic compatibility. On the next slide, the unknown shear flow at the cut is denoted Q0. Because the cross-section that is cut is now open, the shear flow at other locations is determined at all other locations by the formula shown at the top of this slide and derived earlier in this video. Notice that Q determinate is the notation for the first moment of area that is zero at the cut, evaluated according to the second equation on this slide. Although the notation is here slightly different for thin-walled cross-sections with an S-axis, this formula is consistent with what was derived earlier. The next equation is obtained by substituting the shear flow into the compatibility equation from the previous slide. Solving for the shear flow at the cut, namely Q0, we obtain this equation. The fraction of integrals is actually the first moment of area at the location of the cut, capital Q0, here marked with green. The next slide focuses on exactly that first moment of area. The aforementioned integral fraction appears on the left-hand side. According to that equation, the final capital Q diagram for the cross-section can be obtained as follows. First, draw the Q determinate diagram for the statically determinate cut open cross-section. Second, obtain the numerator in the equation on this slide by integration of the statically determinate Q diagram divided by respective thicknesses. Third, obtain the denominator in this equation, which is straightforward because, for example, for a rectangular closed cross-section with width b, height h, and thickness t, it is simply b over t plus b over t plus h over t plus h over t. Fourth, obtain the final capital Q diagram by adding the constant Q0 to the statically determinate diagram from the first step, remembering the minus sign that appears in this equation. On the next slide, another way of evaluating capital Q0 is presented. First, Apply integration by parts to the numerator, which essentially moves the integration from q to 1 over gt, as shown here. Notice that the boundary term vanishes because the first moment of area for the entire cross-section is zero when z originates at the neutral axis. Substitution into the equation at the top of this slide yields the third equation on this slide. If the cross-section has some open parts, for example flanges that stick out from the part that encloses the cell, then the following must be noted. The parts of the equation at the top of this slide that relate to the closed integral around the cell do not pick up contributions from the protruding flanges, 
but capital Q does. In other words, the integration of z times t along s in the numerator of the third equation on this slide picks up contributions from the protruding flanges. This fact is reiterated shortly. For now, notice that when the material is homogeneous, so that g is constant throughout the cross-section, the expression simplifies to what is shown at the bottom of this slide. To reorganize this expression for practical calculations it is useful to define the function lowercase g shown at the top on the right-hand side. The denominator is a constant and the numerator varies with the coordinate s. Substitution of g of s into the bottom equation from earlier yields this expression for the first moment of area at the cut. It is reiterated that g of s is unaffected by protruding open parts of the cross-section, while the integration of z times t times ds must include contributions from those parts, as shown in this equation, where capital Q flange is the first moment of area of the flange and lowercase gi is the value of the g function where the flange attaches to the cell. Once capital Q naught is computed, the shear flow at other locations is determined as for open cross-section, relative to the location of the cut, as shown in the last equation on this slide. An example posted at Tiryaz Toolbox covers the detailed calculations for a specific cross-section. Detailed notes and examples are also posted there for multi-cell cross-sections, which require a few additional considerations, omitted in this introductory video on shear flow and shear stress. The last slide addresses the situation where the coordinates of the shear center of a closed cross-section are known before the shear flow calculations commence. In this case, another approach is possible. Assuming the cross-section has one cell, a cut is again introduced, which yields an open cross-section. Also as before, the coordinate S originates at the cut and traces the cross-section around the cell. The unknown shear flow at the cut is denoted lowercase q0, and the shear flow at all other locations is determined relative to q0, as shown at the top of this slide. Once Qs is determined at all locations of the open cross-section, the moment of the shear flow about the known shear center is computed by means of the second formula on this slide. Here, the integrals are made around the cell, starting at s equals 0 with h being the distance from the shear center to the tangent line of the wall of the cross-section at s. By definition, the torque, t, about the shear center must be 0. Solving for lowercase q0 gives the last equation, in which the last equality is obtained by recognizing that the integral of h around the cross-section is twice the cell area, denoted am in St. Venant torsion theory. Having the value of lowercase q0, the shear flow is determined at other locations using the equation at the top of this slide. Thanks for watching this video. Please visit Tiryaz Toolbox for examples and more videos relevant for the modern structural engineer. See you soon.